It's good to be with you on this Resurrection Sunday, and I'm going to take a pause from preaching through the book of Daniel, and I'm going to preach on the finished work of Jesus Christ, and for that I'm going to get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 5, I'll read verse 16 in a moment here, and I uh, missed you on Good Friday, I was been asked to preach at Trinity Baptist Church in Burlington. Ontario on Good Friday, and um, and it was an encouragement to be among them, but I sorely missed being with you on that day. But uh, it's so good to be back with you. And even as I say that, and as you're turning, every uh, seven years, our pastors are encouraged to take a sabbatical, and the purpose of which is to have a change of pace and personal growth and study, and so I'm edging into my 15th anniversary this summer here as pastor, and so I'll be taking a sabbatical after today, and I'll be out of the pulpit for about five weeks, and typically, um, usually we do several months, but uh, we're going to maybe break it up, so it'll be five weeks this year, maybe a few weeks next year, but we'll see how it goes. But um, I've, uh, it's hard to believe that seven years has gone by since I took my last sabbatical, but I'm going to take, this one will be a little shorter than the last one. But I'll be around, and I'll be doing some studying, and I'll be doing some writing, and God willing, we'll see each other on Sunday. Pastor Will and Randy will each take two sermons or two Sundays for uh, that period that I'm off, and then Dr. Joe Boot will visit us from England for one Sunday. And so that will cover the five Sundays that I'm off, and I know you'll be well served through the ministry of God's Word by uh, those brothers, but I wanted to update you on that, um, and uh, I'll, God willing, pick up on the book of Daniel when I get back in May. So, but we're in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16, and I want to read that to you, and then I'll have a quick word of prayer with you. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16 says, But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. Let's have prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ and where you have been exalted and where you have shown yourself to be holy. I pray, Father in heaven, we pray together that you would save sinners and that you would um, sanctify your people, you'd anoint the hearing and preaching of your word, and you would guide me as I attempt to exposit it and attempt to make application, that you would be our strength this morning and through this weak vessel, you would prove yourself to be strong. And so would you do so, dear God, in Christ's name, amen. So we're in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to jump around a little bit this morning, but I'm going to park here for a good part of the sermon in Isaiah 5, verse 16. And I'm coming to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16 with a question or a dilemma, quandary, and a bit of a puzzle here. You'll note in Isaiah 5, verse 16, it says, the Lord is exalted in justice. So it's justice that brings about the exaltation of the Lord. Justice brings about the exaltation of the Lord. And the dilemma that I'm bringing to you this morning is this. If God is exalted in justice, justice brings about the exaltation of the Lord, how can God forgive sinners? How can he forgive sinners? If God is exalted in justice, which means the just punishment of sin, that is what brings about his exaltation. How can God Almighty forgive sinners like me, and like you, because it is justice that brings about his exaltation. At least Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16 claims justice brings about the exaltation 
of the Lord. Or even if you look at the second half of the verse, the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. So another question I could ask as I come to this is, how could God show himself holy by receiving sinners like us into his sight? Because he shows himself holy in righteousness. No one is righteous. No one is good. So how can God be exalted in justice if God forgives sinners? Or if God forgives sinners, how can God be exalted in righteousness? Or if God is holy or righteous, which he is, how on earth can he receive sinners into his sight? It's a, the text presents a quandary. The Lord of hosts is exalted in justice. And if that is so, how can he forgive sinners? So I'm going to explain this dilemma a little bit more in the first part of the sermon, and then I'm going to present the solution to this dilemma in the second part of the sermon, and I'll provide some applications for you as I point you to the work of Christ. But let's explain the dilemma. The dilemma explained. God is exalted in justice. Why is this a dilemma? Why is this a dilemma? Well, let me first explain what exaltation means. For God to be exalted is for God to be worshipped, essentially. What this means is that he is, when we exalt him, we are perceiving him as worthy. So he's not becoming worthy when we exalt him. He already is worthy. But we are perceiving him as worthy. Worthy. This is what the exaltation of the Lord is. It's not for him to become big, but it's for him to become big in our sight. He already is big, but it's for us to perceive reality. That's what exaltation is. When you begin to exalt in the Lord, when you exalt in the Lord, you are now perceiving God, you are understanding God for who he is. And God is exalted in justice. Through displays of God's justice, we are brought to the point of exaltation. He gets bigger in our eyes, in our hearts. Now, he doesn't get bigger, but our perception of him gets bigger. We stand in awe when he is exalted. We make he is worthy, but we perceive him as worthy when we are exalting him. We perceive him as worthy. And our text this morning says the Lord is exalted in justice. So his justice, essentially what it does, excites the exaltation of the Lord. And I'll show you a few examples in the Bible where justice excites exaltation in Scripture. One example is Exodus chapter 15. It's a passage I've gone to many times to show something of this concept. And you don't need to turn there. Some of the passages I'm going to look at are on the screen, but this one I'll simply read for you. But what we see in the text that I'm going to quote, this string of texts that I'm quoting is that God is exalted in justice. Displays of his justice arouse the exaltation of God in the hearts of his people. So, for example, Exodus 15, verse 1, for context, Israel has just escaped on the other side of the Red Sea, and now the dead soldiers of Egypt are starting to wash up on shore because God has drowned them. And... And the people of God aren't horrified. They say in verse 1, I will sing to the Lord, for Moses sings, leads them in song, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my exaltation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. 
And then he goes on and he lists the reasons for exalting him. The Lord is a man of war, it says. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Notice that. What do the armies of Egypt become in, under, when they come under the power of God? They don't become as a rock sinking to the bottom of the sea. They don't become as a boulder sinking to the bottom of the sea. They become as a stone sinking to the bottom of the sea. Of the sea. God is exalted in his justice. He has displayed justice upon this wicked people by casting them into the bottom of the sea like a stone. It goes on Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the floods stood up in heap, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome? In glorious deeds doing wonders. And he goes on and on in that passage to describe God's justice upon the Egyptians. And so what does this great display of justice, the punishment of the wicked, what does this do in the hearts of God's people? It arouses this exaltation among the congregation. They exalt in the Lord because they have Witness, they've been witness to his justice. Similarly, in Psalm 9, we see something of the same. Verse 5 and through 8, it says, You have rebuked the nations, you have made the wicked perish, you have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. The cities you rooted out, the very memory of them has perished, but the Lord sits enthroned. Forever. He has established his throne in justice and judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with upright. So what are the, what's, what's going on in the psalm? He's praising the Lord because God has destroyed wicked cities. He's exalted in justice is what I'm saying. Over and again we see this theme in scripture, verses 11 through 12. Capture this again in Psalm Chapter 9, sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds, for he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. He's punishing people who are wicked, and his people are rejoicing because he has heard their prayers. God is exalted in justice. At the end of the Psalm, it says, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. So what is this exaltation of the Lord we're talking about this morning? Well, the exaltation of the Lord is teaching men that they are but men, and the Lord, he is God. Exaltation occurs when God becomes greater in our eyes and we become smaller. And that happens when we behold great judgments of God. When his judgment flashes before our eyes, we see the exaltation. We begin to exalt in the Lord. So Psalm 89, verse 8 through 14 says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, the north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand, righteousness and justice 
or the foundation of your throne, steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So what's going on? Well, I'm demonstrating from Scripture that it is the justice of God, his anger displayed towards sin and sinners that brings about the exaltation of God. He is exalted in his justice. Is a theme that is prevalent right through the scriptures. Revelation 19, similarly, one last text. The whore of Babylon has been slain and now her smoke is going up to the heavens as she burns. In Revelation 19, verses 1 through 3, there's a great congregational hymn that breaks out whereby they say, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. What am I demonstrating here? Well, I'm demonstrating that God is exalted in justice. It is displays of God's wrath towards sin and sinners that brings about the exaltation of God in the hearts of his people. He is exalted in this. God's, and, and so, and so the, the dilemma is, if God is exalted in these events, displays of his anger and wrath towards sin and sinners, how is it that God can forgive sinners? How does that bring about the exaltation of God? Right? Like, this, is, this really should be a question that presses in on us and bothers us until we have the answer. God's law is just, and God's punishments are just. God's law is just, and God's law is unchanging. And even as his law is just and unchanging, his punishments are just and unchanging. How, how can he be exalted if he forgives sinners? Like, you know, if, if God's laws were unjust, it would be one thing. Right? Or if God didn't enforce his law, it would be another thing. But God actually just clears us of our sin. We, we certainly wouldn't exalt in God if his laws were unjust. You know, if, if one of his laws that he, he's going to tax you on, on rain or something like that. <laughs> you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be exalting in him because you'd see that's unjust. But you exalt in him because his laws are just. And even if his laws were just, and he, but he didn't enforce those laws, then you wouldn't exalt in him. So if he had just laws, like you shall not steal, but then he told you to leave your keys for the car thieves, you wouldn't exalt in him. Right? So they get a free ride. But you exalt in him because he has just laws and just judgments. And it's unchanging. And so this brings about the exaltation of God. God is exalted in justice. So, so how can he forgive sinners? It's the question. John Trapp said, he shall be religiously acknowledged, approved of, and worshipped as an enemy to sin and an upright judge because of his most righteous judgments. That's what I'm trying to communicate here. God, in his judgments, shows himself as an enemy to sin. And the, and the dilemma is real because... Not only does the Bible show that God is an enemy to sin and sinners by punishing them for their sin, and he's exalted in that, but it also shows that God forgives sinners. So I'll give you some examples of this from the Bible. He, he certainly forgives sinners. Psalm 31, 
verses 1 and 2 says, In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Or Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2 says, I blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. He forgives sinners. Or the promise of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, verse 34 says he forgives sinners. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So this God, who is exalted in justice, also forgives sinners. And I'm trying to reconcile these two statements. Because it is a quandary. We are sinners, and the law accuses us, and the judge damns us. When you, when you come to the law, the law, it, it's, it's an accusing law. It says, you did, you did, you did, you violated, you violated. And you look at all that's wrapped up in God's law, as I've explained over these last few months, it accuses you. You stand condemned under it. And God is exalted in his justice, which means he will punish lawbreakers. But yet the scriptures tell us that he forgives sinners. There's so much more to this quandary that I could talk about. For example, if God forgives sinners, so let, let's say this was God. Let, let's give me, let me throw in a hypothetical situation out there. Number one, God is, is just to judge sin and must judge sin because he's just. He must uphold universal principles of justice. But then number two, God forgives sin. Now, if there's not a way to reconcile those two statements, number one, God is just in his punishment of sin. And number two, God forgives sin and sinners. If I can't reconcile those statements somehow, and bring them together, then this means God is unstable. You can't trust his justice. And if you can't trust his justice, you can't trust his forgiveness. If there's not a way to fuse these two statements together so they become one. Like, this is what I mean. If God promises to punish sin, but then goes ahead and forgives sinners, then how do I know he's not going to unforgive sinners and punish sin? There has to be a way to bring those two things together and reconcile them so that they become one. And this is the dilemma. I mean, if God can just wink away judgment because after all he's God, then why can't he just wink away forgiveness? One day he wakes up and decides he's going to punish sin. Next day he wakes up, he decides he's going to forgive sin. Next day he wakes up, he decides he's going to punish sin. How, is, is that God? So, so what is going on here with these statements? Number one, God is exalted in justice. Number two, God forgives sinners. How is this possible? How do we reconcile these two? This is the puzzle, the dilemma the quandary that I'm bringing to you this morning. How do I reconcile those two statements? This concept, if God is exalted in justice, how can he forgive sins? Well, here's the solution for you this morning. And for the solution, I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. And you'll, you can turn there. because I want to spend a little bit of time looking at that as I consider the dilemma that we're facing. The solution to our problem here, the salvation that we share in Jesus Christ, and it's explained here in Romans 3, verse 25 and 26. We'll begin reading, "...whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood." To be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So, and then it goes on. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier 
of the one who has faith in Jesus. Martin Lloyd-Jones commented on these verses and said, there are no more important verses in the whole range of Scripture than these two verses because it explains these concepts coming together, justice and forgiveness. He went on and he said, there is nothing that the human mind can ever consider which is in any way as important as these two verses. Because it brings this, these ideas together. It solves our quandary, our dilemma, our puzzle. Verse 25 speaks of a propitiation by his blood, which means, it's, it's talking about the death of Jesus, and it simply means that Christ's death has satisfied the justice of God, his anger towards sin, and turned it away. It's the propitiation by his blood. Satisfied the justice of God and turned it away from us. And then you see a repetition in the text after you note the satisfaction of God's anger and turning it away in the concept of propitiation. You see a repetition. So in verse 25, it says, this was to show God's righteousness. Or in verse 26, you could say, it was to show his righteousness. Essentially, his justice. Verse 25 talks about the propitiation showing his righteousness in how he passed over sins previously committed in the Old Testament, by Old Testament saints. And then verse 26 tells us that it was to show that he can be just in justifying us. So I'll read verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the bloody cross of Christ maintains justice while forgiving sinners, and the dilemma is solved. God in the cross shows himself to be just, and yet God in the cross forgives sinners. These two issues come together and fuse in one event, and the riddle is solved. The riddle is, the dilemma is, if God is exalted in justice, how can he forgive our sins? And the solution is, the bloody cross upholds God's justice in forgiveness. So that it says in verse 26, look at what it says, so that he might be just. This is a fascinating thing. The bloody cross, yes, justifies sinners in that our forgiveness is purchased, but the bloody cross also justifies God in the justification of sinners by showing that he is just. So that in Jesus Christ, his justice is upheld. So he's not a God that just winks away sin. He doesn't just wake up one day and say, well, uh, I'm angry with sin, and the next day I'm not angry with sin. Your sins are forgiven. That's not him. These universal principles of justice are maintained and upheld so that God can justly forgive sins. And that occurs in the death of Jesus Christ, which is here called his propitiation, absorbing the justice of God and turning his justice away from us justly. Injustice. So Robert Haldane said, in the propitiation then of Jesus Christ, the justice of God and the salvation of sinners signs, shines conspicuously. It, it, it's, it's like... God shines the light on the cross and shows not only on the cross does he forgive sinners, but on the cross he is just in his forgiveness of sinners. In the cross, God is just to forgive sinners and his justice is upheld while he forgives sinners. As Matthew Poole said on this, that no wrong might be done to his immediate justice by which he cannot but hate sin and abhor the sinner as such. The speaking of the cross. So, so just pay attention to what I'm trying to say here. God has upheld the standard of his holy hatred of sin 
a just disposition towards sin, and his abhorrence of the sinner by hating the sin and abhorring the sinner in Jesus Christ so that we can go free. Right there. These two concepts come together. Forgiveness and justice. God forgives you the sinner while he hates your sin in Jesus Christ. So think about these words again back in verse 25 and 26 of Romans 3. It was to show, verse 25, this was to show God's righteousness. In verse 26, it was to show his righteousness. And this word is describing God putting his justice on display in Jesus Christ. Justice. And so, and so it's like God raised Christ up on the cross for everyone to see. And then he put a spotlight on him that was so bright it could drown out 10,000 suns. And he pointed both his hands at him. And with a great booming voice, he said, I am just. I am just. That's what the cross proclaims. Right in that moment. The justice of God is on display in Jesus Christ. So that God, look at what it says in Romans 3, two times, showed his righteousness, his justice. It was on display for everybody to see. And while he displays his righteousness, he displays his forgiveness towards sinners. Right there. So, so let me give you a few more quotes to drive this home. John Gill said, being smitten by God by the sword of justice is he stood in their place instead, our place instead. The sword of justice came down on Jesus. Not because he deserved to die, but because we did, but he upheld justice. Justice came with a price. It had to be satisfied. And it was satisfied in Christ. Bunyan said, Christ, when he died, died not to satisfy Satan, but his father, not to appease the devil, but to answer the demands of the justice of God. Justice. Then he said, man should have been pierced with the spear of God's wrath, but to prevent that, Jesus was pierced both by God and men. Man should have been rejected of God and angels, but to prevent that, Jesus was forsaken of God and denied, hated, and rejected of men. Justice. He satisfied universal principles of justice in the cross. So that forgiveness and justice now come together in this event. So you get to... Passages like Isaiah 53, and what does it tell us? He carried our sorrow. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. His soul makes an offering for our guilt. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Right there in Christ. Justice. Justice. Look, Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you feel sorry for him. That's not why he died on the cross. He didn't die on the cross primarily to be an example to you. And certainly he was, but not, is it not as primarily as a moral example. It certainly was, but that's not primarily why he died. Not to make you feel sorry for him, not to be an example. He he didn't die on the cross primarily to show the evil of men. He did. That did happen. But that wasn't the primary purpose of his death. No. The bloody cross shows the justice of God in the forgiveness of sinners. He raises them up shines a spotlight on him that could drown out 10,000 suns, points both his hands at him, and says with a booming voice, definitively, I am just. Right there in Christ. The bloody cross shows the justice of God and the forgiveness of sinners. 
So the riddle is solved. If God is exalted in justice, how can he forgive sins? The answer is, he justifies forgiveness with the bloody cross. So that justice and forgiveness become one at the cross. Psalm 85 verse 10 says, righteousness and peace kiss each other. God's justice and God's peaceful disposition towards us. So his angry disposition towards us in our sin and his peaceful disposition towards us in forgiveness come together and kiss each other at the cross so that our sins are finally punished and we are finally forgiven in that moment. So the, you, if you're in Christ, if you're believing in Jesus Christ, will not come into judgment because Christ came into judgment on your behalf. You, if you're in Christ, according to John 3.18, are not condemned. Because he, Christ, stood condemned in your place. Or you, if you are in Christ, your sins have been remitted, expiated. They've left you. Why? Because your sin was imputed into Jesus Christ in that moment. He became sin for us on the cross. It, righteousness and forgiveness wed. The two become one in that moment. We are forgiven because, because God's justice is satisfied. So the riddle, the puzzle, the quandary was, if God is exalted in justice, how can he forgive sin, or, sin and sinners? And the answer is, he justifies forgiveness with the bloody cross, and his resurrection confirms this. Confirms that it's been received, the payment's been made, the forgiveness has been procured. So there's a riddle, and there's the answer to it. If he is exalted in justice, like Isaiah chapter 6 says, how can he forgive sinners? Well, he exalts himself in the justice of the cross and forgives sinners all at the same time. It all happens at once. Happened at once. But let me close with a few points of application here to wrap this up. Forgiveness did not come easy and cheap for God. Some people preach a gospel of where it was a cheap and easy forgiveness. Ah, God just forgives because he forgives. He, winks, at for, he win, winks away sin. He magic wand. It's done. Look, if that's the type of God you serve, then he can wink away forgiveness too. Magic wand forgiveness is gone. He, that would be a very capricious, evil, tyrannical God. A God who can wink away sin is a God who can wink away forgiveness. It didn't come easy and it didn't come cheap for God. He offered up his son, Jesus Christ. And in Christ, these two things came together as he suffered on the cross. It was difficult. Forgiveness was difficult. And it was expensive. And so do you have this forgiveness? Have you been forgiven? Are you in Christ? Have you trusted in him? Are you trusting in him right now? Because this is the only way to find forgiveness, is in the cross. And if this is true, which it is, justice has been satisfied, then he has objectively cleansed our record in Christ, in an historical event. So have you ever wondered, am I really forgiven? Did he really forgive me? Did he really forgive that sin? Sometimes your sins come to your mind when you lay in bed and try to get to sleep. And Did he really forgive that, even that? Can he really love me? Or maybe there's just one or two sins that are really bad that he can't forgive. The rest, of course, he can. He only forgives the good Christians. Did those things ever come to your mind? Because if they do, this message is a message of comfort for you because he has objectively forgiven sins in Christ. 
Every one of them. If you don't think he can forgive sinners, that means you do not believe that Christ's death satisfied justice. But if you believe that Christ's death satisfied justice, then you believe that Christ forgives sinners and all of your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. All. Objectively cleansed before God of your sins. And if your sins are objectively cleansed before God, God cannot revoke it. Irrevocable forgiveness. Because the debt for sin, the justice, the wrath has been satisfied. I brought these questions up earlier in the sermon. Do you ever wonder, can he change his mind? I mean, if he was angry with my sin a few Years ago, and now he's forgiven my sin. Well, what if the day arises when he changes his mind? What if he wakes up one day and he goes back on his word? If he can forgive me, can he unforgive me? He can't unforgive you. He can not unforgive you. Why not? Because that would be unjust. Do you see this? And God cannot be unjust. Your forgiveness is rooted in justice. That must be upheld by God. Because he is exalted in justice. This should cause explosions in our hearts of exaltation. Why? Because the record is completely cleaned, we are objectively forgiven, and that forgiveness cannot be revoked. Why can the forgiveness not be revoked? Because it is grounded in an unchanging universal principle of justice. Because forgiveness and justice came together at the cross. It is built on the foundation of justice. The forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. He cannot wake up one day and unforgive you. Because that would be unjust. Christ has objectively died, objectively for sinners, to objectively forgive us. Not built on his emotion, on a whim, on a wink, on the waving of a wand, but built on justice actually being satisfied in a moment, in the death of Christ. And so if this is the case, which it is, it's all true. Your sins are objectively cleansed in Christ. He can't revoke it. Then you shouldn't be berating yourself for your sins. Because he's not. Nor should you be bringing up the sins of each other if you've forgiven. Because he's not. The slate's clean. It's done. And this should, like, this should bring about a good sleep at night, actually. Because the guilt is removed and it's finished. And God has forgiven you. It should cause your heart rate to just settle down and relax a little bit. To really put you at ease. Take the edge off. Because this has been solved. This quandary has been solved. God is exalted in his justice and his forgiveness is rooted in that justice. So it's objectively taken care of. It cannot be revoked. We shouldn't be berating ourselves for our sins. We should really sleep well. And then... Most importantly, I think, is it pertains to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16, which says, the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice. This, 
This should stimulate and kindle and arouse and energize and excite the exaltation of God from our hearts. Forgiveness should. Our forgiveness in Jesus Christ should. Because that forgiveness is grounded in justice. So that God shows himself strong and wise all at once in the cross. And the justice on display on the cross in which our forgiveness is grounded. It brings about the exaltation of God. Because the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice. And so we should exalt him. Because he always has been just, is just, and always will be just. And he is justified in the forgiveness of sinners, which brings about the exaltation of God in the hearts and praises of his people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for our Lord Jesus and that you have maintained your universal standard of justice in him and you have forgiven us our sins objectively in Christ so that our forgiveness is rooted and grounded in justice. You are justified in our justification. And for this we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.